And then we'll jump in. Father God, I thank you for um, your word and I thank you for how it changes us and transforms us. Lord, I pray as we look at uh, this scripture this morning that you will remind us of your holiness. Um, you will amaze us that we can approach you, that we can know you, that we can have a relationship with you, Lord. I pray that that would be a work in our hearts, Lord, that we would be so amazed by um, the grace and mercy you've shown us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, let's read uh, 25 to 29. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed, so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe, for a God is a devouring fire. Okay, well, this passage looks back one more time uh, to this thunderous voice, this scene again that we looked at quite a bit last week on Mount Sinai, and we compared the two mountains, Mount Sinai, thunder, lightning, um, uh, trumpets, a deafening uh, voice from the skies, this God, uh, if you come near the mountain, um, you will die, uh, to now being able to approach God for his grace and mercy, to Mount Zion, to Jesus Christ, who has opened the way for us. Um, Because we live now in the new covenant, access to God open through Jesus Christ at the cross. We can approach this God. Now, the overall theme of this section I want to pull out to us, so I'm going to give away the game now, and then you'll see it as it comes goes through, is that you could be forgiven for thinking, God on the mountain, thunder and lightning, do not approach. Grace, mercy, new covenant. God's changed. No, he hasn't. He hasn't changed. And this is the reminder, as as if the writer of Hebrews wouldn't let us off a second for thinking that, like, New Old Covenant, Holy Mountain, can't approach him, now grace, mercy, you can go to him, the, the, the veil's been opened, you can access, access God. There could be, uh, and I think we see this all over the place today, we'll get into a bit more in a minute, but this idea that, um, verse 29, for our God is a devouring fire, that's the tension there, there's like, God's holiness, Wait a minute, but we can, we can access them. We can go in. We can do what we want. We don't have to wear our Sunday best on a Sunday morning. We can just, you know, I come to churches in shorts, go to fitness, all this kind of stuff um, has changed. But God hasn't changed. So that's what we're going to look at, okay, as we go through. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going. So we cannot forget that God is not safe, okay, that he is not safe. Has anyone read the Narnia books? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to read a very famous quote. Um, I think it's Lucy. I might be getting this really wrong. Um, I think it was Lucy who's, who's talking here. And he says, Aslan is a lion? The lion? The great lion? Oh, sorry, Susan, said Susan. I would thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm going to read that again because something happened over there. <laughs> Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And we know, I hope I'm not giving anything away, Aslan in the books is this image of God, this is the symbol of um, protection and safety and transformation and creation. It's a wonderful thing. Um, a theologian called Liz Warren writes this, God always wanted his people to come near to him, which is why he sent his son. Only one person could properly fear the Lord in this world. He was a shoot from the stump of Jesse who delighted in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 1 to 3 reads this, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Because of Christ, God's invitation to draw near to him extends to all nations. And because of Christ, we can draw near with confidence based on his perfect fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not about keeping our distance from God, but about drawing near to him. When we fear him, we come close. 
when we draw near to God through Christ again and again, it means we are choosing to turn from sin. True fear of the Lord draws near in faith, fearing God because he is God, but also knowing he is gracious and merciful. He isn't safe, but he is good. I love that. Because we can compartmentalize, that's the right word, God. Again, as we talked about a few weeks ago, one-dimensional views of who God is. We can see him as this loving God who would never do anything to discipline us. Hopefully that's been debunked in the last couple of weeks. He does discipline us. That he would never perhaps guide us or put us in situations where we would find it hard. That's a load of rubbish. He does it all the time to stretch us, to let us lean on him, to teach us through our sufferings. But we can compartmentalize him and think, oh no, he's only good, therefore only good things happen. Anything that's bad that must be of the devil, that it can't be of God. Um, God is safe, he's kind, he's a refuge. The, the, these can be almost, they look, can look like paradoxes, can't they? Um, and I was trying to think of an illustration, and the only thing I could come up with was this. And forgive me, I do like my war movies, so this is the, my only illustrations are associated with war. Um, I recently was watching Saving Private Ryan, again for like the hundredth time, and there's a scene where at the end where the Germans are coming into this, this town which, they're, the, which the main characters are defending, and this is just a common uh, tactic, but when a tank would go forward, this mighty piece of machinery that can blow up buildings, the men would hide around it, they'd crouch down and follow the tank, and this fearsome beast that could destroy things, the men would get as close to it as possible for safety. And that's, as, that's in my mind as what I could think of almost as God. He's, he is to be feared and he is mighty and he is powerful and the maker of worlds. And we, we should come in awe and, and this fear, but it's a fear that also protect, provides protection. Does that make sense? So it's like being near this tank, which I know could destroy and kill and do great many things. But when I'm near it, I'm safe and I'm protected. And I'm a little bit amazed at its power, but I can still, I can still draw near. Has anyone got any better illustrations? <laughs> or any understanding or wisdom upon uh, this, this, this kind of paradox of we can now draw near to God, to this new mountain, but he's still a God to be feared and to have awe and to be, you know, to bow down before. Any, any thoughts on the difficulty that this can be? Well, I want to build a kind of a picture to help us. Because I don't know if this is where a lot of us spend time dwelling and thinking about the holiness of God. Which is really what this is all about, these verses. Let me just, if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to read probably two of the most famous sections of scripture in the Bible that about God's holiness. Um, Revelation 21 verse 20, sorry, first one. 21 verse 1. It says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he would dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the, older, for the old, old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And this relates back to this shaking. So it says here, um, verse 26 back into Hebrews, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. And what this is referring to is that if, you know, you could be forgiven again, coming back to what we said at the beginning about thinking, this God has changed now. He shook the earth back then by his voice. He doesn't shake things anymore. No, not only does he shake the earth, he shakes now, not just the things that are physical, but now he shakes like one commentator put it as a heaven quake. He shakes the spiritual things. He shakes the heavenly realms. He's going to shake everything up and make it new and transform it all. So again, it's this idea. Don't, don't shrink God now that we can approach him. He's still massive. He's still holy. He's still glorious. And it is incredible that we can approach him. This is kind of my main point that I'm going to keep coming back to. Okay, so heaven and earth will be shaken. 
They will be changed so that everything temporary and not glorifying to God will fade away. The new creation based on Jesus himself and his resurrection will shine in comparison to all that was. So all the things, everybody, like I know a lot of you are like drenched <laughs> today. All the things that annoy us and we just think, oh, why? Like wasps, why do they exist? Like the, the little things or the big things, the horrible things that get us down, the, the things that make us want to weep and cry. All of that, as we've just read, will be wiped away. Everything that doesn't bring glory to God and glory to Jesus Christ will be completely wiped away in this new creation will come about that we, if we believe in faith in Christ, will be a part of. And again, the writer of the Hebrews um, is trying to uh, remind them all of this fact, whilst saying, you're going to be here, everybody. You're going to be able to spend eternity with Christ, where there'll be no tears and there'll be no pain, and you'll be able to glorify uh, Jesus and be in complete peace. But don't shrink God. Don't shrink him. Just because we can approach him doesn't mean that God is now... Um, changed in his nature as it were don't swap that for temporal things which will be in this case shaken away don't go to those idols again don't go back to the lesser things which he's saying here god's going to shake up and they're going to go going to burn it up and it's going to be gone okay so we shouldn't treat the good news of jesus christ in such a way as to forget that through christ's sacrifice we don't stand before a holy, righteous, all-consuming God and have nothing to say, okay? That, that God is still the same God. It's just staggering that clothed in Jesus' righteousness, we can approach him. If we diminish that, if we diminish God's holiness, if we shrink down God, you know what happens? We think less of the cross. We're not amazed by it. It's like, I can approach, yeah, Jesus will let me, may help me to approach God. So what? God's lovely and he's kind. Yes, he is those things, but he's also so much more so that we're absolutely astonished that clothed in Christ, we can now approach uh, the Father and, and not be burnt up, not be blown away, not be destroyed because of our lack of holiness, but we can approach him. The struggling truth is that God pays the price of our salvation. He does the whole thing. God in his holiness could not commune with us as sinners, and then he pays the price so that we can access him that's amazing love, isn't it? Jesus became our propitiation for our sins, a payment for our sins. We read in, in Isaiah, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the, Lord, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The cross of Christ becomes all the more staggering when we consider this. When we consider the fear of the Lord, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, when we consider these things, it should then make us think, wow, isn't it amazing that I can know this God? And Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. So, verse 25 again, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses. So if the people of Israel, when this almighty thundering mountainous God that they saw, if they couldn't get away with it, a warning here, what makes you think you're going to get away with it when he's in the heavens? Going to shake the heavens and the earth, not just the earth, but everything. Don't think that he shrunk somehow and then you can get away with this now. No, 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 no. Almost the bar has been raised, as it were. So if people who refuse to listen to Moses found themselves in trouble, what should those who refuse to listen to the one who is so much greater than Moses expect? Now those of you who have incredible memories as we've uh, been through Hebrews for a long time might remember, but I'd be very impressed if this is the case because I certainly didn't and I only realised it when I read it in a commentary. But this is a complete looping back to the beginning of Hebrews. So if you go to Hebrews chapter 2, he's almost... It's almost literally saying the same thing twice. Like any good um, preacher or teacher uh, will do. They'll circle back to where they started and re-emphasize the point they were making at the beginning. And he's doing that here. So uh, chapter 2, it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. 
For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, see that's just what you said again, verse chapter 12, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. See how he's emphasizing this again. Listen, don't neglect what he said at the beginning. He's now looping around as he's coming to the end. I know it might not feel like we're coming to the end of Hebrews, but he's coming to the end of Hebrews. He's looping back this, this point. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. So listen. It's so important to, to, to realize the, the truths of what I'm trying to put across to you. And again, for our practical, for ourselves, don't shrink God. Don't, don't think he has changed. And again, just re-emphasizing stuff I've said before over the weeks. Don't swap out this valuable relationship with Jesus Christ for lesser things. See the beauty of it. Be amazed by the grace and the mercy of it. And then you will not be pulled away to lesser to lesser things. So don't forget who God is. One commentator writes this, the true God is not tame, nor does he spoil his children. He is like a fire. The holiness of God, emphasized through the temple ritual, is not undermined by the fact that in the new covenant, his people are invited into his presence in a new way. God has not stopped being holy. God hasn't changed a bit. It is rather that Jesus has opened the curtain and we can approach him. Okay? So let's just think a little bit. Well, quickly a question. Why? Why? Maybe an obvious question. Why do we perhaps struggle to think of God in, in these terms of holiness and of his glory? And we're going to read Revelation 4 in a second where it talks about him in his throne room. Why would we prefer to think of him as the shepherd? Um who walks alongside us daily. Why, why, am I, why am I not happier with the throne room God? The thunder and lightning. The trembling voice. I don't know. For a lot of people, if they've had a difficult upbringing, they might see that again, authority, if it's a father, sits there telling you what to do. That's just not good. So when I read, like we're about to, of them, God sitting on his throne, and that might bring up connotations that are not helpful. You might think, I don't want anything to do with that kind of God. But again, we must have a multidimensional look on our, on our God because he is a multidimensional God. He's complex and he, he's deep. And I haven't got the right words to describe the level of who he is. But if we look at Revelation 4, hopefully we can get our minds to a place, hopefully, where we can understand a bit of the level of his holiness and of his glory. So uh, Revelation chapter 4 uh, verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that trumpet again, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. 
And then if you turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the door, posts, and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and a sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. See, when we comprehend, and those two sections of scripture are wonderful in helping us understand God's holiness, if we, if we're, if we can. But when we comprehend God's holiness, we will begin to fully understand Jesus and what he's done for us. It will make us abundantly thankful, which you'll see um, uh, in verse 28 of Hebrews 12 in a second makes us thankful that we can very fact that we can stand knowing this God talk to this God people such as we why because of Jesus Christ who clothes us who has torn the veil who gives us access to him is staggering isn't it and that's why everyone a lot of the time I which you'll, you'll no doubt I've realised and probably think well, he keeps going on about this, but the more we dwell um, upon God's holiness and, 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 and our lack, the thankfulness to Christ grows. I wrote this, the lower view of God results in a lower view of the cross and in turn we become a less thankful people. So a lower view of God and his holiness results in a lower view of the cross, big whoop, why is this amazing? And in turn, we become less thankful. The appropriate response, therefore, is gratitude and, and worship. And, and I really believe, everyone, you can, you can understand and you can, um, you can know the level of, I suppose, maturity or the level of thankfulness um, a person has towards God also attributes to their understanding of the cross. If I mean a thankful person, a thankful Christian, someone who just content with the lot in which God has chosen for their life. I guarantee if I have a conversation with them, the chances are that they, they have a, a large view of God, of his holiness, and they're staggered by the very fact that they know him through God's grace. And as a result of that, I see God as holy, I'm amazed by his grace. The practical outworkings in that person's life is a life of thankfulness, or a thankful person. They live, you know, John Newton saying, it's amazing grace every morning. They saved a wretch like me. That's like the rolling practical outworkings of a person who knows God's holiness, has a high view of God. And the result is thankfulness, everybody. Why do we struggle with thankfulness? When we co comprehend all that, it's staggering, isn't it? <laughs> when you comprehend that, you think, what am I doing? I know Jesus Christ. But we do. We get tired. I'm very tired at the moment, everybody. I'm very tired at the moment. Uh, and, 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 and being thankful and waking up and not just wanting to go back to sleep again and, 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 and just plowing on into the day and, and maintaining not a woe is me attitude requires help from the Lord. And, uh, well, let's just, let's just read some verses. I know we know this, but it's good to be reminded by his word and not just by me. One chron you don't have to turn to these, let me just read them to you. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 44. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. And at the end, in Christ Jesus, okay? Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, 
whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Philippians 4, 6, one of my favorites, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with what? Thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Psalm 106, verse 1, praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Sorry, I just read that again, his love endures forever. <laughs> but as I say, I'm convinced you can tell the level to which someone truly understands the cross by the level of thankfulness in their life. Um, it should mark us, everybody, as to be a thankful people. And thankful in all circumstances, as difficult as that might be. As difficult as in our flesh, in our tiredness, in our struggles and suffering, that we should be thankful. Now, it's easy enough just to say that, but this, this is what I was pondering in the car on the, on, the, on the way here this morning. I believe that the moment you become a Christian, when you've given your life to Christ and he's filled you with your Holy Spirit, in many ways, now this has been recorded, so someone might get me for this, in many ways, you've put yourself right now in a difficult position. And I'll explain what I mean by this. You've put yourself in a position that now there are certain things that the word of God says you should do in order to have the promises of God fulfilled in your life. And if you don't do them, you will struggle. All right. So it's a sense of you now can access the peace of God. You can access the Holy Spirit is within you. He says with prayers and petitions in all circumstances. Yeah. And then it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Right. If we don't pray. You're not guaranteed that. If we don't spend time with God, you are not guaranteed that. It's like, and I've used this analogy before, if I buy a diesel car, I am now committed to diesel. If I go and put unleaded in that, the car will blow up. All right? I have the Holy Spirit within me. I'm a child of God. I am now am committed to the ways of God. If I don't do the things of God and follow out the ways of God, then we shouldn't be surprised if we lack peace. If we lack thankfulness, if we lack joy, because we're committed to that now. We put him on. He's in us. I'm in Christ and he is in me. And therefore, it shouldn't baffle me if I'm living a life of, of sin. And I know I am. The Holy Spirit is, is, uh, is vexed and he is he's being quenched in me. I shouldn't be at peace. Why should I be at peace? I'm a committed, I'm a child of God now and he's my father and he's not going to, as we read, he's going to discipline me, put me back on track because he loves me and keep me going on that way. Don't be shocked. Does that make sense? So if you're now diesel, put diesel in. <laughs> if you're unleaded, put unleaded in. Yeah. Th this is the way in which that this now works. And for thankfulness, I'm, I am convinced that in order to grow in thankfulness, the fuel that we need to put into us is looking at the holiness of God and then looking at the cross. Looking at the absolute majesty of God and then looking at his his uh, humbleness coming to this earth for us that we might know him and spend an eternity with him equals thankfulness in all circumstances and it is a clinging it can be a clinging because we're not perfect everybody i'm the least person to preach perfectionism but i just want to raise the bar because <laughs> i know that you can we could go there and we can know greater peace and greater joy and greater thankfulness i won't want to settle for it's just tough. But putting the right things in, and it is spending time with our Father, isn't it? And it's spending time reading the Word and spending any time in prayer. And I promise you, it works. It's like Paul when he said, trust me, I'm telling you the truth. It's like, okay. <laughs> but trust me, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I'm not comparing myself with Paul. But the, that it, it that's the question I've written here in bold. Why do I complain about anything? Why do I complain about anything? When I consider the holiness of God and the cross of Christ and the grace he has bestowed upon me, why do I complain about anything? So, I'm going to let that hover there. I was going to give us a caveat out, but <laughs> just let it hover there. It's not easy. But don't mean that we shouldn't pursue peace, joy in Christ. And by in doing so, put the right fuel in. That's all you remember. I think I said last week, the, the most thankful people that I know live in God's word and in his presence in prayer and it bleeds from them 
want of a better expression, but it comes out of them, and they're just thankful that one results in the other. Everybody, it's not it's not a trick. It's not like oh they're fake. Like somehow they've done it through some other means. You can't. You might, might last for a couple of days. I'm just gonna be thankful. I'm just gonna be positive. <laughs> God's like ah no. If it's not in me, it won't. You're on my side now. You're my child. You do it my way. Try. Okay, you be thankful. All right. But if it isn't in me, then I'm gonna. I'm going to get you. I'm going to say, look, more joy, more peace, more thankfulness in me. Come, come and see me. starts with the word, doesn't it? Yes. Sometimes I feel, if I, could, if I could share bluntly, sometimes I feel, I watch people and I think, why are you filling the car with the wrong fuel? And I see them pulling up to the, the, the petrol station and it's a little leaded car and they're putting diesel in and I just want to like knock the, the, the hose out of the hand. Put the wrong thing in. You put the wrong thing in. Why do you expect, why are you not learning? Same circles, same Here's things. It's true, guys. Well, I'm hopeful that every time you get in a car, you're going to remember today. <laughs> Hopefully, and every time you go to the petrol pump, you're going to be like, <laughs> checking is the right one. I always check in case the tubes have got tangled, and I'm not like, you know, anyway, you got to be careful. But when I was, uh, got to my point when I was kind of studying last night, and I was putting this together, and I, uh, it brought me to a place, um, really, of, of praise. I mean, it says, it, it says, um, verse 28, since we are receiving a kingdom... That is unshakable. What? Let us be thankful. Please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. So again, he's wanting to remind us. He's wanting to draw us back into the true grandeur of God. And I I found myself um, just thinking about uh, hymn lyrics, really. Uh, So we're not going to sing. I just want to read some to you. You will know these, but they help to magnify us as we... Uh, nearly finished. Says, and when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on a cross, my burdens gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Let me just finish with this. The life and ministry of Henry Ward Beecher abounded in thankfulness to God. One of his prayers he prayed, Accept the thanksgiving of hearts that this morning are laden with gratitude. O oh Lord, how much we have, how much have we to be thankful for? How many of us have great joys unutterable? Beecher once explained the difference between a grateful and ungrateful heart in a vivid way. He said, if one should give me a dish of sand and tell me there were particles of iron in it, I might look for them with my eyes and search for them with my clumsy fingers. And be unable to detect them. But let me take a magnet and sweep through it. And how would it draw to itself the almost invisible particles by the mere power of attraction? The unthankful heart, like my finger in the sand, discovers no mercies. But let the thankful heart sweep through the day. And as the magnet finds the iron, so it will find in every hour some heavenly blessing, some heavenly mercy, some heavenly grace. Only the iron in God's sand is gold. So I want us to think, I think perhaps about two things um, today. One, our petrol, (laughs) clearly, (laughs) in our our cars. Um, As a child of God, are we we filling ourselves with with the right things that we might know his holiness, that we would then be staggered by his grace? And, And think upon this magnet, that if we're just going through the sand, trying to get these particles of iron out, um, it's only going to make us angry. But with the right heart, with God's help, this magnet can sweep over and all of the thankfulness is there that we never saw. So it's asking God every day, give me eyes, give me vision to see the blessings, the mercy and the grace that is in my life. Right down to the shoes on my feet, 
food in my stomach, family I have, friends I have, hopefully the church that you're, that you're in will pr- produce a new thankfulness. But at the root, everybody, because this church could fall down, this, um, we might lose family that many of us have. But in Christ, if he is the centre of our joy and the centre of our thankfulness, the cross is that. That never changes. That never moves. That can be our um, anchor. Thinking of other hymns, that could be our anchor, can't it, in the storms of life. I'm not going to start singing. <laughs> so let me pray. Um, it's been a bit shorter, but hopefully we'll remember what we've said. <laughs> Father God, I thank you uh, for the incredible majesty, Jesus, that you left. That in the glory of, of where you were for eternity past, that you would condescend, that you would come in humility to be um, a human being on our behalf, Lord, is staggering. When we read in the scriptures of your holiness, your separateness, your total difference to us, Lord, the fact that you would then die for us, Jesus, that we might know you, oh Lord, help that to produce in us deeper levels of thankfulness, deeper levels of of joy. Lord, your word tells us if the Father could send the Son for us, how much more will you not provide for us all things? So Lord, may the cross be the centre of our, of our peace and our thankfulness. Knowing, Lord, you've done that for us. You'll provide for everything else. You'll look after us. You'll get us through. So Lord, we, we pray for um, greater understanding, greater levels of thankfulness. Lord, may it be a challenge to our hearts, Lord, to look through, through the sand and, and see the, the particles of, of, of great uh, blessing and grace and mercy that you've bestowed upon us each day, I pray. Uh, for our joy, Lord, and for your glory, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.